If it feels like you're in a trance or you find yourself floating, it might be because we're here with the vibe goddess Namakau Star. What I want to know is what is the perfect vibe? The signature Namakau mood that we should all strive for. I think the word will definitely be authenticity and freedom. Those are the things that I hope through my work and through my music that people can find within themselves. And I hope that's what people resonate with. And whatever that means to you at whatever time you're in is very important. And you have to kind of allow that to happen. And that's definitely what I feel is the perfect, you know, Namakau vibe. It's being true, being free, expressing your most authentic self as best as you can. We've had a lot of chats about authenticity on the pod and a lot of people say sort of, you know, that it's important to them or it's something that they they want in their art. But uh, it's very rare that we come across someone who can elaborate on what authenticity is. What does it mean to you? Like, how do you be authentic? I think for me, firstly, there were times in my career that I didn't know what it looked like because I was constantly, you know, existing in reference to the music and the art that I appreciated most and what I felt would serve my career, you know, financially. But once I started taking a step back and kind of reminding myself of why I started to do music, that's when I feel like authenticity became kind of like a compass for me. And what that looks like to me is basically existing without the filter, you know, because I think it's very interesting how we, you know, filter ourselves in in different ways um, or we try and stay clear of the things that we feel people won't understand or we try to stay clear of the things that are uncomfortable for us to feel um, because so many things pass through us and we see and perceive and experience so many things. So for me, authenticity is the discomfort and the comfort that comes with being vulnerable, being honest, calling it how you see it, you know, not shying away from the difficult parts of the music or the conversation, be it from in the studio to when you're putting your work out. So many things make a person authentic. All your lived experiences make you who you are. Like that is your design and not shying away from the things that tug at your heartstrings or not shying away from the things that you see in this world that make you who you are and expressing those things. That's what authenticity for me looks, feels, sounds like. Namakau, the compass of authenticity led you to 100k all-time plays last year in Apple Music. Congratulations on that there. Um, and obviously in a world where a lot of artists don't really show the process behind, you know, how they sort of, all the steps that they've taken to get to the final product that we end up seeing. Um, you know, especially as an artist that is taking a very organic and a very authentic approach, how did you actually go about, um, you know, reaching that 100,000, you know, all-time plays on Apple Music? What is the honest and sort of, you know, best approach that sort of helped you get to that sort of milestone? Yo, um, I think it's a very layered question that you've just asked me. I think every step you take is, it's, yeah, it's a culmination of many, many steps and many, many experiences and many, many shifts in my perspective, you know, um, when I started music, like for me, <laughs> just being able to have the resource, you know, to put my music on SoundCloud was the beginning of what everyone sees now as the 
a hundred K or 200 K streams, you know, it's, that's the first moment, you know, the first time I ever decided, okay, cool. They're, they're PCs on campus and I can actually set up an account to put my music on SoundCloud. Like that's where it all starts to be quite frank. You know, the process for me has been falling in love with the process initially, you know, thinking about music beyond the music was very difficult for me because I just wanted to put the music out and I just wanted people to find it. But now my perspective has definitely shifted to how do I get my music to reach the people who need to hear it and to reach the people who want to hear it or should be hearing it? You know, essentially that's marketing. But for me, that's like, I would say, how I position my vibration and my energy to call in people who actually listen and people who celebrate the music and people who understand the music. Cause I'm not trying to make music for everybody, you know? So I know that those hundred K streams are the culmination of me making very, very intentional decisions to get my music to the right people and doing that relentlessly. You know, for me, I always try and treat every release with such care and attention to detail that every time I do put music out again, I can reach more people and get it to the right people because, yeah, I believe the power of the internet has made it kind of like there's no limitations. There's more challenges and there's more clutter, yes, but there are less limitations in terms of how you can get your music out. Mm, mm, Makes a lot of sense. You know, what I'm getting there is that it's been a very calculated and a very sort of like fleshed out journey, you know, from the beginning, you mentioned SoundCloud there. And a lot of, this is my sort of gripe with a lot of, you know, people that, you know, get those sort of milestones is that we never really get to see. We only see them when it's like, hey, 100,000, you know, we don't see that sort of SoundCloud process and such much, you know. So it's pretty cool to sort of get that perspective in terms of, you know, where it sort of started out and the decisions that you made and that you're not making music for just anybody. It's all really just calculated. And just looking at you as the product that we see now, rather as the human being that we're seeing now, you know, in the creative process and, you know, the type of stuff that you're releasing, the type of stuff that you're posting on your social media, what sort of like key event or life event did Namakau go through that basically led her to being the Namakau we're seeing now? Yo, um, so for those of the people who are listening in who don't know me, I used to go by a different stage name. I used to go by Indy Ray. I grew up in Johannesburg and in, I think, the formative parts of my music career. Um, you know, I was just experimenting with music, you know, just throwing things at the wall, seeing what sticks, you know, opening myself up to wo- working with producers from Sanin from Nigeria, from Joburg. So I was genuinely just trying to figure out my sound. And simultaneously, I definitely saw myself being under like a major label and and getting signed. And, you know, kind of that was how I envisioned making a sustainable living off of music looked like at the time. So I think through that, I definitely experienced myself making music from a place of um, scarcity and desperation. And, you know, I love Joe Berg for instilling the hustle in me and the drive. And, you know, everybody's moving at 100 miles per hour. So you, you've got to keep, keep up. You've got to keep going. And with that being said, I always found this dichotomy between the music I was making in the studio versus the music I would kind of fall into when I would attend um, events and there would be open mics and I would be freestyling and people really resonated with the, the music I was making or the things I was doing on the spot. So I think 
at some point, I would say in 2019, I kind of started like experiencing an ego death where I was like, I don't know who I am. Like, what is happening to me? <laughs> what is happening to me? Because my my spirit is definitely like pulling me in a different direction in terms of how I want to show up in this world, you know? And I think that catalyst for me to change and have that rebirth was kind of being removed from Joburg. I, I left, I moved to Cape Town. And while in the middle of that like transition, the pandemic happened. So it really gave me a lot of time to sit with myself, sit with my thoughts um, and the pandemic as well. With I didn't have any studio equipment, so it kind of forced me to just have an outlet, which was putting out freestyles on Instagram. And I think that's where my rebirth actually happened. I think trance is definitely a key moment where I wrote trance as Indie Ray, but I knew I wasn't Indie Ray anymore. And I was like, oh my gosh, Mars Baby produced trance. And I, I told Mars Baby, I was like, yo, I think something's happening to me. This is like my new sound. This is my new era. And I was like, this is the type of, you know, narrative. This is what I want to say to the world. This is what's true right now. And yeah, that was definitely the the key moment. I think, as I said, it's always like these small moments that lead up to this big moment. And for me, that would definitely be my move to Cape Town. The live music scene in Cape Town also definitely played a very big role in me being like, I actually could attract the resources to kind of make the type of music that my soul desires. And I've always called myself a genre bender for that reason, because so much music passes through my body, but what comes out is very new and true, but yet somehow kind of nostalgic. And I think that's, those are all the things that I embody. And that's what I want to hear in this world. Very well said. Thank you for that answer, Anna Macau. Uh, Megan? Considering the way you like to bend and fuse genres, um, like R&B and hip hop and soul, if you weren't making the kind of music you make now in this era, what genres would you experiment with? Yo, that is, it's a very difficult question for me because I really am in a space where I play with so many genres. Like I've recently become very much interested in, I think, a funk slash pop kind of energy. Um, but then I also imagine myself doing a lot more like rock and roll, um, something that back home we call Zam rock, and infusing that with, you know, my love for soul music, you know. Mm, I also do see myself doing blues as well. I think blues is... Blues fused with some kind of rock and roll would be pretty cool. Yeah, there's so much. <laughs> there's just way too much music to experiment with. And I'm already like, for me, already in my current like state of mind, because I'm back in this creative uh, mind space again, I've been pushing myself to go a little bit more harder in my raps, you know, and not necessarily shy away from the fact that my voice is loud. Um, cause I always hone it, hone it in with the thought of being soulful in mind, but sometimes being soulful has like, is, is also being loud and, and proud. So yeah, like, I, I hope that answers the question. Cause that's a very tough question for me. Cause I always see genres as a blend. Like I've never seen a genre as one thing, like no genre is strictly that genre, you know, and for the sake of a genre evolving or becoming what it was, there has to be a genre that's behind it for it to be what it is. And that's how I've always seen genres. Even though, even okay, even though you have a genreless stance on music, you have mentioned that um, soul music is like a source of life for you. I'm curious, where does that love for soul come from? 
Yo, my love for soul comes from home. It definitely comes from home. I I grew up, my father very much exposed me to soul music very, very early, like in my life, from my childhood. And it's definitely played a big role in how I see music. I grew up on D'Angelo. I grew up on Prince. I grew up on Erica Badu. I grew up on Joel Scott. I mean, that's not all I grew up on, but definitely very, very like key memories of me actually want to like, you know, sit down and look at lyrics or open a CD booklet and be like, yo, what is this person saying? Like definitely soul music as well as, and I think it's something I, I can't really shy away from and I don't really mention it, but gospel music as well. You know, the likes of Freddie, Fred Hammond, um, Kirk Franklin. I think people don't really talk about how much gospel music has influenced soul music. And perhaps that's, it's more of a, just like a toned down or pulled back means of expression, but just like even when, you know, gospel musicians just go off the cuff, like when they're in the moment and extend a song and a song just goes on because it's just right from the soul or right from source. That's definitely something that I grew up around a lot, you know, and that for me played a major role in how I express music. I think one thing that we need to definitely touch on is one of the posts that you've put up a while back mentioning, or you, but it was basically a player like sarcasm and such, but it was basically just stating that, you know, being in the music business is rather stressful. Um, what would you say some of those stressful elements of being a musician are and what sort of remedies or ways have you sort of found, you know, around those certain issues? Just for anyone who might be listening, who might be an artist as well, who may have come across something similar, um, you know, to sort of help them as well. But very much about your experiences as well. Yo, so I think, so I recently left my uh, my career in advertising to, you know, kind of venture off into the music business, like seriously um, within, like, you know, I think a structural institutional <laughs> kind of space and it's very stressful. It is <laughs> very stressful, man. I think because you start to see how many levels they are to what makes music happen. So much happening in the backgrounds, you know, beyond the process. I feel like sometimes artists center themselves and I feel like, yes, they are very central to music, but so many other moving parts make music happen. And I've become very privy to, you know, why rejection happens. Or let's say you don't necessarily get playlisted or why it's so valuable to pay attention to your rollout, pay attention to your cover art, you know, like everybody just wants to make it. But the process of making it involves making it happen involves so many pivotal, you know, points that we tend to overlook. And I recognize the frustration that comes with overlooking those things because it normally results in you feeling uh, from a musician's point of view, feeling unaccomplished, feeling like you're not doing that, feeling like, resentment um, towards the industry and the politics of the industry. So my advice is, I don't think I had, have advice. I think my approach has really been to remain very steadfast and clear on what I want out of music and always remind myself why I started, you know, and also fall in love with the process, you know, and the process for me looks like cover art. The process for me looks like building a community. And the reason why I even, you know, I can make jokes like that on my social media is because I know that I'm attracting an audience or I've attracted an audience that gets me, you know, and because I've also moved independently for so long, there's only, 
only people who get it, get it. <laughs> so yeah, I would always say remain steadfast. Like you're never, ever, ever too made to learn, like attend those workshops. I, like since I started, I think I've, I've, I always attend workshops if I have the capacity to. I sign up for things, these little programs that assist in, you know, helping me learn. Like last year, I did um, a year program for music production, music business, and it was really helpful. You know, it pushed me out of my comfort zone, just being behind the mic. Like now I'm, I'm in the software, you know, it, it, they also gave classes on how to build community. And I think also sometimes we see ourselves in isolation. We don't see ourselves as this bigger, as part of a bigger picture. And that's where we feel isolated and there's no means to kind of reach the type of people you want to reach. So yeah, like be steadfast, take care of your mental health. Like if you, if you are feeling like you're going crazy, take a step back, start again. Music's not going to go anywhere, you know, and you're not running out of time. You're literally exactly where you need to be every time. Even when you are frustrated, there's probably something you can learn from those moments. Would you say that leaving advertising or leaving your nine to five has sort of put you on a whole new level? Um, would you say that is sort of the difference as well between an artist who is doing this as a hobby, uh, which would basically be on a part time basis and an artist that is doing this full term? Like, you know, are you in a better position to be successful as an artist if you're doing it full time as opposed to an artist that just does this sort of as a hobby and doesn't really go full send? you know, on it? I think contextually, I think it's very, you know, I don't know. It's a touchy subject for me. I don't think any person who has a, a full-time job and is doing music is doing music as a hobby. I think they're probably doing it for a means to push their music. And that's how I always viewed it. You know, my full-time job was a means to be able to make short films, to pay people in my community in order to like for us to make the music or just have the resources to make the music. So I don't necessarily like maybe for some people it is a hobby, but for me contextually, like having a full time job was more of a means to sustain my music career. And even what I'm doing now, like I do, I'm in the music business, but I'm always, I'm not always doing music. So I still have that dichotomy of having to sit behind a desk and dedicate time to, you know, applying for funding as well as meeting different people and, you know, organizing things and being a part of an organization that, is in the music business, but there's still other things that I have to do in order to kind of just get paid. And it feeds the music too, because I'm always talking to people that could point me in the right direction or teach me something that I need to know, allow me to tap into a different music market, you know? So that's how I see it. Um, in South Africa, it's very hard to make a, a full-time living or of music. So if you do have a nine to five, I think I would be strategic and be in like a creative field, like IE advertising, because for me, if I wasn't in advertising, I probably wouldn't have been able to execute a rollout as I do now. So that's how I see it. Like if you need the resources and if you don't want to work from a place of lack and desperation, I really do feel that you need to supplement yourself with a job so that you're not living in survival mode. Is it easy? No. Um, hopefully you can find an environment where you can work, where you can have a work-life balance so you can just push yourself till you pass that threshold and actually make a sustainable li living out of music. Very beautiful. Thank you for that, Namakal. Meeks. You have so many credits and you play multiple creative roles. So what's the most enjoyable part of your work? <laughs> Yo, I think two things I really enjoy. I enjoy visuals. I enjoy visual arts a lot. 
I kind of kick myself all the time for not like taking um, visual arts at school because I was discouraged from it. But I see how that plays out in my I, ability rather to direct other visual artists or directors with my music in mind. You know, I think executive producing is an amazing hat to wear in the music creation space. For me, I find so much joy in the studio and I've more recently began to find a lot more joy in co-writing and writing with other people and throwing things on the wall and, you know, merging ideas. That's a great, that's always been such an enjoyable part of my career. And then, um, yeah, strategic thinking, crazily enough, like, you know, or just, I think shooting my shot or being able to say, Hey, we're going to call this a tour and, and then you do that and you make it happen. I love seeing things come full circle. I don't like it when music doesn't come out. I don't like it when art doesn't come out. So I'm very much a big fan. Like my the most favorite part of my, um, career at every point point in time that I'm in it is seeing something firstly come to life from the studio, then come to life visually, then seeing it reach people sonically and through the airwaves and through the interwebs. That gives me a whole lot of joy. And I think also getting feedback where it's like, hey, like this reached me. Like I was at game listening to buying a TV and I heard rewind. I'm like, damn, that's crazy. <laughs> like that's cool. That 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 brings me so much, so much joy. Um, and speaking of rewind, what is your writing process with something like that? Um, how do you start a song? So rewind was completely off the cuff like freestyle um yeah like that's the thing about my process it's very 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 like random and I think that comes from my background in freestyling like I remember growing up my dad and I used to when he was walking me home from school we would literally read words backwards or he'd be like, guess the color of the next car coming ahead. Or he'd point at a, a tree and he was like, okay, what rhymes with that? And, you know, I think crazily enough, like that's where my ability to just like pick things from the clouds um, or to just channel and speak and create on the spot comes from. So rewind is essentially a freestyle. I think the only part I wrote because I had gone so far with the flow and there was like a change in the beat was um, the miracle of life is time. The miracle of loving you is energy sublime. The miracle of feeling. That was the last word I wrote. Then feeling like running away. My God, I need an escape. Like all of that came after that off the cuff because the beat was still running and I had to, I didn't want to do the take again. So I just kept going and it came full circle, but other songs like floating, for instance, I did have more of a writing process and it's always also what the beat makes me visualize, you know, instrumentals make me visualize things. I, I, I think of music very visually. I write visually crazily enough, like, I have to see it. I have to see what, you know, the mood and what what's the tone? Like, how is this music setting the tone for a real life, like visual experience? And that's how I write. And then I also infuse just moments. So sometimes I just throw a line out and if it sticks, I build off that line. And I think that comes from you know, practicing freestyles with my audience members or just like ciphers where you have to complete what's given to you and actually make it make sense. And yeah, that's that's how that happened, I guess. When we initially approached you sometime, I think it may have been last year, if I'm not mistaken, you didn't mention that around this time you will be in Berlin or rather Germany. Um, so how has that experience been for you being out in Germany? What has the whole 
um, stint that side sort of taught you as an artist? What have you taken from, you know, your experience in Germany that you've now added into your arsenal as an artist? Yo, um, it's actually been such a surreal experience for me. I've been wanting to travel for so long, honestly. And I think since I got here, firstly, I really do believe that Joburg can prepare you for anything. <laughs> That's one. And then I also see and feel politics so much more here. I feel my blackness. I feel my hair. I feel that I stick out a whole lot more because I am in Europe and, you know, um, I'm a minority here. And that's something that I definitely have seen come to the fore um, through my lens and point of view, like being here for some time. And I also recognize how being in a, in a, in a country where you know, the government really supports art and there's so many other factors like, for instance, transport and safety and nighttime safety, which affects how people kind of experience nightlife culture has been super interesting because the city never sleeps because their they trains like running all the time. So people can actually go and occupy spaces at any time they want. And I was like, damn, that actually, you know, it seems like something that we overlook, but it's actually so pivotal to how artists are able to make a living. And then there's also a great busking culture here. You know, there are literally spots for people to busk and get money. And, you know, people actually really support like my first busking stint did really well, you know, and I was like, damn, like just having a space where you could literally write your name on a board, have a hat, like have a mic, have some instruments playing and doing your thing could literally put you in front of a lot of people. And it, it was also humbling because I've never done that before. And it, it was kind of humbling to see people like gravitate towards the music, like organically. And, you know, English isn't the first language in Germany. So that was pretty cool that people just really gravitate to good music and good wholesome vibes. Lastly, like there's a lot of space. There's a lot of like work to be done. I think more Black artists in my genre and category could be represented here. So I also definitely see a gap and opportunity for myself to expand here. And I, I, quite frankly, I'm very excited and I'm super, super grateful to be able to be right outside of my comfort zone and see myself potentially making an impact on other parts of the world. That is very, very beautiful. You know, just listening to the things that you've experienced, you know, out that side and some of the shortcomings you're seeing there, which brings me to, it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, uh, artists of color could be, you know, more represented that side. You being um, an Afroculture curator, you know, have you been able to sort of carry that out in Germany? Um, and if so, how have you sort of been going about doing that? Yeah, for me, that's definitely just for right now, you know, because I'm definitely hoping to come back. And I've, I've been here for just over um, a month, just over a month. I think the Nama Kao experience is definitely the first step to being able to kind of curate, you know, what it means to be Afrocentric, what it means to be authentic, and what it means to feel at home in your body and in any musical space you occupy, um, no matter who you are or what you are. So, yeah, like so far, I think just having the spaces to perform is enough for me. And just organizing um, my tour, the Voice of the Future tour is kind of like the first phase of what this could potentially become. Um, also just being able to attract, like, you know, attend open mics and be booked as a special guest act, you know, headline in the same spaces that I've done open mics in is really, really cool. So I think there's just, as I said, a lot that can be done. It's very wide open for me right now. More than anything, I am also just trying to be very intentional about 
where I'm playing, who I'm attracting, where I'm like putting myself out there, where I'm also just using my energy to kind of plan and see where I can expand. Also just travel to different studios and work with different people and just find that silver lining, I guess, the the golden thread that can allow me to build on what I've just started. For people who have only listened to the studio versions, what can they expect from a live Namakal performance? Yo, um, <laughs> I think I always say this, but you have to be there to get it. Like It's super intense. You know, shows get so intense. I think sometimes I, I, I leave my body. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not there. And then what I've noticed happens when, you know, a, a show gets super spiritual and open and everyone's heart is just like has been opened by the music like by the time I'm done performing like I have to have a little weep at the end just to kind of feel in my body again so yeah you could definitely expect your heart to be open your mind to be open to dance to feel at home seemingly unfamiliar faces become familiar and friendly when you're in the Namakau experience, when you're immersed in that experience. It's very immersive as well. Like that's also the cool thing. There's so much that happens. It's the way we connect with each other. It's the way people contribute by knowing the music. It's the way people contribute by not knowing the music and learning the music on site with me. Um, It's discovery. It's, yeah, it's love. It's all love. So it's very immersive. That's how I would describe it. Because you have such an active nightlife where you are, is there maybe enough reason to have two sets, like a day set and a night set? Because I can imagine that your vibe is very much, like it's very much solar charged. So I'm wondering if there would be like a lunar set, maybe? That is actually really cool. I've never thought of it that way. Um, For me, I go wherever I'm called or wherever there's opportunity. Um, I would definitely double my set. Like the more capacity I get and the more calls I get, I definitely do that. I think it's really cool. Daytime performances are actually super lit. I remember I did, when I did feel good series, it was right at the su- the sunset and it was very special because it was in a like open space and it was just super magical. And I've never thought of it that way, but you just planted a seed. <laughs> definitely, um, definitely something I think about now. I will be thinking about rather. I would definitely do both. Well, let it grow, hey? That is something I'd really love to see and hear. Um, who would you share the stage with if you had your absolute choice? Oh, that's, that's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, yeah, I think Tim's. Tim's would be an interesting, like, curation, I think, for me. Um, I I think I see myself a lot in her and how she navigated her expansion. I think another person that I think is very much in alignment with my kind of sound is Erica Badu. I think that would also just be an interesting curation because a lot of people like have said that I'm very reminiscent of her. So I thought yeah, that might be cool. The when you're looking at the way, um, you know, well, let's look at the name basically, Namakao Star. You got the star in there, and you're a very spiritual person. Um, I see some stands of astrology as well, and some of the stuff that you release, um, some of the artwork, and some of the captions, and just the overall vibe that you emit. So, um, is there any connection, you know, between you know that the name? And those sort of external forces, you know, like astrology, star signs, and spirituality, you know, break down the name for us. 
Okay, cool. So Namakau is very layered. Namakau is my third name, which was given to me by my grandfather, which he named his first album Namakau. And Namakau means to be brave. And I've always seen myself as a very, like, you know, gutsy, brave, bold person, you know. And before I even knew that was the meaning of my name, I've always leaned on names. I've always seen, like, you know, the parallels between the name of a person and who they are and how they show up in this world. So, yes, I am very spiritual. and. Essentially, you know, um, one of my mentors was like, you should definitely just call yourself Namakau. But I just feel that 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 the star is very pivotal, very important, because I'm an Aquarius moon. And yes, astrology is definitely like, <laughs> if you caught that, like, you know me. Astrology plays a very big role in how I see, how I exist in the world, you know. So the star card in Aquarius is the Aquarius card. And I found that quite interesting. So my moon sign is Aquarius and in astrology, uh, the Aquarius is the star. So it's kind of like a guiding light and the Aquarius angel basically sent down by Zeus to, to pour blessings into the river. So Aquarius is actually an air sign just so people know. Um, And yeah, and then my sun sign is Leo. And I always say this, the sun is also a star. So I kind of just put those two together. And yeah, I'm a a brave star. (laughs) That's how I see it. And spirituality plays a role in how I show up in this world. So yeah. Everyone in your family besides your grandpa because you mentioned there that he even released an album and such. Um, do they understand, you know, your sort of mission and what you're trying to achieve, you know, as a musician? Do they get the type of music that you're trying to make? Because you did say that it's not for everyone. Um, you know, when you mention or speak of your music to your family, besides your grandpa, I'd like to think for some reason that he understands, considering that it does sound like he's an artist. Do they understand what you're trying to do? I think. You know, it's initially on, especially on my father's side, like everyone's kind of just left in terms of how we think. We've always been, you know, we talk about the universe openly at home. We talk about the matrix and we talk about, you know, how the game is rigged and we talk about politics a lot at home because my father, my grandfather is an ex politician and a writer. So I think him being the man he is definitely filtered over into the rest of the family. And initially I I genuinely feel like my dad and my mom, like they didn't really get it, you know, and they didn't see it as a sustainable means or a way to make a living. But I think once my music started working for me, like my my dad was definitely like, okay, you're definitely onto something. And he became became rather more reciprocal to my path. And now we now we talk about it openly, you know, and he trusts me a lot more, you know, and I've also been trying to teach him to trust himself because even when I was leaving my 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 job. He was, he was like, what you going to do? What you going to be? And I'm like, trust me, like, just trust me. This is, this is all working out. This is exactly where I need to be, you know? And he once said to me, he's like, you literally live your faith. You live your faith. And I think that really stuck with me because this has taken a lot of like faith for me to just push through and rise above a lot of the challenges that I've experienced, like feeling blocked, feeling overlooked and underbooked and all of those things. But now, because I have this resilient spirit, my father and like my family can see it's undeniable. Like, and they celebrate that I am who I am and I feel much loved and appreciated by my family. Other than your family, um, who do you trust 
for constructive feedback? Like, is there any circle that you show your unreleased work to or your work in progress? I trust myself for constructive feedback. I will actually say that, like, I I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist, but I think I'm grounded in reality, not just as a creator, but as a consumer of music and visuals and the likes. Um, my manager as well, which I recently started working with this year, I think she's also a great soundboard. And I also trust my, the producers and the people around me, you know, like my co-collaborators, they're always like, even on site in the studio, you know, we, we are making the music and we're trusting that process. But part of that process is also taking a step back and being like, Hey, does this work? Does this feel right? And yeah, I have a great collaborative community around me where we're not just like, all hype in the studio, like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Like there's moments where we're like, mm, this isn't landing, you know, or we challenge each other. So that skill of being refined and making music for a long time and not just doing it by yourself is great because you don't get stuck in the loop of just hyping yourself up or putting yourself down. You just find that sweet balance. When you say we, is that Lord Keys? Well, that was definitely Lord Keys for landing. Um, he, w- he was a great um, springboard for music. He's a great producer as well and a great writer. So I could push him production-wise or I could plant seeds in his head. And then he also has this great technical ability to hear things in the music that perhaps I would have overlooked, you know, or even lyrically we, we would, you know, would soundboard off of each other, like, Hey, you know, this mix isn't sounding the way it sounded in the session, or this is, does the vibration is changing. Like we push, like, I don't know how many, you know, rounds it took to get floating over the line, for instance, Whereas songs like Rewind, it's literally the first, the original vocal that we recorded in 2020 is what we hear today. And we didn't change a thing because it felt right. So that's the type of collaborative process I have with all the producers that I work with. It's very grounded in reality, but it's also very grounded in the process of what's best for the music, what's best for the artist, what's best for the listener. I'm uh, some big label exec from Motown Records. I'm coming to you as an Amakal star. And I'm like, listen, I will handle everything else. All you need to worry about is just making the music. Um, I'll worry about, you know, all the workshops. I'll worry about getting people who are going to, you know, basically sort out everything else that you've been doing as an individual. All you need to worry about is just making music. Are you taking the deal or not? So what I'm trying to find out here is, you know, would you ever sign um to a deal that maybe necessitates that there may be be some sort of uh not as much control over your creative freedom but at the same time everything else is handled for you or is that creative freedom just that you know important to you that you have to sort of keep it and also then do every everything else that comes with it at this stage i okay cool so i'm not taking the deal because top line, the deal looks very, very, very like appealing, right? But with everything that they handle for you, you have to pay it back in sales. You have to pay it back in performances. So before you reach that threshold, you're literally slaving away for your music and not having your creative freedom like that just that doesn't make sense. Like the trade-off isn't worth it for me. Um, If the Motown records man came to me, I was like, I would definitely be like, yo, let me actually get on the line with an entertainment lawyer. That would be uh, like, you know, my approach. Or I would 
to say, hey, like, what are you actually giving me? What am I actually loaning from you to get all those things sorted out? Because essentially a business, a, a deal like that is a loan and a long-term loan. And if you're telling me I have to make three albums before I can get that out that deal, then I have to call your bluff and just, you know, have my <laughs> creative freedom and my hustle and build my community large enough to actually have people pay for my music. And instead of recouping on an insane investment that a major label is making on me, I can invest in myself and recoup it either way. So yeah, that's how I see it. The fact that there is a chance that the label could expose you to a lot more people, therefore it could you know, you could reach a wider audience quicker. Would that on its own maybe persuade you in any way? Because, I mean, obviously you've been doing it organically and you've been doing it for a very long time. And I can only assume that, you know, the journey sometimes can be a bit frustrating and such. You know, how much sort of weight do you hold when it comes when it comes to, you know, audience in terms of, you know, reach and the number of people you're reaching? Do you feel like having them offer that would also sort of maybe persuade you a bit? Or is it also just like, nah, I'll just, you know, if it takes me five years to reach a wider audience, I'll do that. The thing is, I see it as I don't want to reach a wider audience if it's not going to be the music I want to make. Then I'm just like, selling myself short, you know, and I guess that's the dream. The dream is to be put in front of, you know, a million plus people and heavy PR and brand deals. I mean, that's the ideal, right? But for, for someone like me, I'm very steadfast in what it means to be real and to not be manufactured, you know, it's important for me. That's very important for me. I feel like it's, I think it's deceiving. Honestly, I think it's deceiving. I don't want to be a slave to something that I'm truly not. And it's a hard decision, right? But I'm also, as I said, like, I'm not desperate to be famous. Um, I've achieved so many things as an artist with like 6,000 followers that people with 100,000 followers could never dream of, you know, and yeah, that doesn't matter to me right now. You know, I think the fame is secondary for me. It's secondary. And mind you me, if Motown is coming to me at this stage of my, my career and asking for me, like, yo, I'm probably on the right path because if I'm hot on the streets like that, there's definitely another offer on the table that's going to come my way that suits my creative needs and my promotional needs better. And I could just be patient and keep going until that opportunity comes. So many quotable lines in your answers. Oh my God, this is really incredible. I echo what Megan was saying earlier in that these responses are very beautiful. Thank you for these. Thank you. Thank you. Passing on to you, Megan. What have you learned from working with the planetoids and how did that creative relationship start? Yo, firstly, I, I genuinely believe like the planetoids, their work ethic is unmatched. They're really, really hardworking and very creative beings. It was really cool working with them. So we are both at the, in the same distribution label, Paradise Worldwide, and that's how the connection came about. And they really like floating and they were like, yo, we hear you, we hear you on this track. Um, and I listened to this track and it really reminded me of my days singing in the serenade group where we would make like pop renditions and rock renditions. And yeah, it kind of took me back there. And I was like, I did, let me shoot my shot at this verse. And they really liked it. So over Zoom, you know, they would help me export stems. Like I literally just started recording myself and, you know, building <laughs> myself technically behind the mic and with my equipment. And, you know, they supported me. We'd hop on Zoom calls. We rushed to get it over the line as well. Load shedding was also like I was in the thick of load shedding, but 
we managed to get it over the line. And I think we really connected over that collaboration. Um, actually going to be performing with them at Bushfire Fest, which I'm super excited about. And yeah, like we're going to be hanging out soon. I'm going to Hanover to make more music with them. So it's just been an organic growing relationship and they're really cool bros. And yeah, that's basically how that happened. Is there something that you've sort of taken from your other collaborations? Because you've worked with quite a few people, a lot of local names that I'm very much into, um, people like Jade and Daniel. Uh, Can you tell us more about those? Yeah, I think, you know, when it happens, it happens. You know, I'm very grateful that I've been able to collaborate with a number of really, I think, key players in in the South African music industry at this point in time, especially in the R&B and alternative R&B space. Jaden, such a sweetheart, may his soul rest in peace. He just reached out, you know, he was also very supportive and he just, we just gravitated towards each other. I never got the opportunity to actually meet him in person and everything we did was just remote. And it's just a matter of responding and, you know, having a producer follow up and be like, hey, like this song really needs to happen, really helps me because I know they believe in the music that much. Pola Pola, same kind of thing. Like I just couldn't hear anyone else on Breathe. I just couldn't hear anyone else on Breathe. And I had to have her on Breathe. And it took a while to get get that verse over the line. She's also very much a perfectionist as an MC. And I'll just follow up like, yo, I need that verse. I need that verse. Like this isn't coming out if this verse isn't ready. But like I pushed her and it came together and I had the opportunity to perform it with her for the landing tour, which is amazing. Lord Keys, how I met Lord Keys was just through Instagram lives during the pandemic and he would join the lives. And one day he was just like, yo, if you're down to work, like let's work or I can show you your way around your equipment. And that's how that relationship started. So I think it's just, yeah, the internet has been super pivotal in terms of me connecting with so many collaborators. And I think also having the drive and the will to push people to get the music over the line and vice versa with the people who've collaborated with me is so important because I believe in the music and I'm going to push you to get it out. Like it's not staying on the shelf if we're working. And that's why I very much don't like people who aren't doing music seriously approaching me to (laughs) collab because I take this very seriously so that work can get over the line. Like there's no point in it being in the vault. So yeah, that's how I see it. Um, I like how you say that you hear people on a track. How do you know when a song is finished? And on that last bit, um, how much is in the vault? Yo, um, how do I know when a song is finished? Yeah, I think when when a song has, as a writer, I, I don't know if everyone has this process But when your song has its full circle moment within that little universe in the sonic space, that's when a song is complete. And sometimes the only sad thing about a song is that it ends. So when it finishes and you're like, oh, damn, let me play it again. Like the song is finished. (laughs) Um, That's how I see it. Like I know a song is complete when there's a resolution in the poem or the song. And sometimes like you just need to leave a cliffhanger for people. That's also a cool approach to writing a good song. It's like, and having people want more is leaving them with a cliffhanger. And that for me is slow motion at the end of season love. It's like, everyone is like, why isn't this a standalone track? And it's like, cause this is the moment that it needed to have. And this is the moment it deserved. So that's how I know a song is finished when it either leaves you wanting more or it leaves you with a kind of feeling where it's like, Hmm, okay. Yeah. Like we resolve this catch me floating full stop. Um, yeah. (laughs) Earlier you had mentioned, um, 
you mentioned you well you touched on it briefly or rather in passing where you used to be called Indira, right? Um, what are the key differences between Indira and Namakal Star? <laughs> cool, cool. So I think the distinctive differences in Indy Ray was definitely a superhero of some sort, and she was more of a shield more than anything. She was something that I wore to navigate the roughness of Johannesburg, um, queerness, queer spaces. She was very much like my protective armor. And I believe Namakao Star is more of an embodiment of the music. There's no real armor, like, but still very strong, very stealthy. And also more, I think, groundbreaking in moving into uncomfortable, you know, or less explored territories of music and doing it you know, unapologetically. Whereas I believe that Indy Ray was kind of a, a merged version of Rayma, the quirky black girl who never really felt secure, but always knew she was that bitch. So I would wear Indy Ray to be that bitch and to push myself further and just do it, just make the music no matter what that that's what I would say the distinct differences are between Indy Ray and Namakao. Not that different, but still very different. Is Namakao still that bitch? I'm still that bitch. I'm that bitch. Born that bitch. Shout out. <laughs> yeah, Namakao, Namakao is even bigger, badder, and a lot more wiser, like, and a lot, lot more grounded in reality and authenticity. Like, I'm not pandering to be accepted or to be seen. I just am. And I'm not going to be missed either way. So she just keeps on keeping on. That is very beautiful, Namakal. Thank you so much for joining me and I, you know, for this episode. We've kept you for quite some time, but I'm super stoked that we were able to get, you know, all this insights into your world Uh in, in the world of, you know, someone who's such a brilliant and amazing artist and is representing South Africa really well overseas. So with that being said, um, your handles, where do people sort of get in touch with you if they want to work or what's the best way people can even support you? Amazing. So I am on Instagram, Namakau star, Namakau, N-A-M-A-K-A-U dot star, Twitter, Namakau underscore star, YouTube, Namakau star, Facebook, Namakau star, TikTok, Namakau star. Um, you can hit me up. My main channels will definitely be Instagram and, and Twitter, where I'm very much like engaging with my community and just like, you know, connecting and you know, sharing my thoughts and ideas and myself and all the other things that I do outside of music, you'll probably catch on my Instagram and Twitter pages. Please reach out to me, say hi, send a message. I'm always open. I'm so open, maybe too open, but it's chilled. <laughs> um, yeah, that's where you can find me. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I think I'm really trying to grow my YouTube community. I put very, very special work on my YouTube. My short film for landing dropped last year and I want more people to see it and be aware of what can be done and who is actually representing in the visual space in South Africa. And yeah, that that that's definitely my call. Those are the places you can reach me. And if you want to send over a beach, you can literally just pop me a mail and yeah. And remember guys, please be a serious artist. If you're going to be approaching number car, like we're not playing games here. Let's be like bloody real at this point. So please, if you're considering that, you know, take your stuff seriously. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me as well. Hey, um, anytime, anytime. We're grateful. Like it's always, yeah, I could talk for so long as well. So this was really, really great. Really calming and just felt like talking to old friends so thank you so much for the platform 
Hey, thank you so much for joining us. To anyone that's been listening to this, it's been an epic episode with Namakal Star. Um, for everything Sludge Underground, we've got our website, www.sludgeunderground.com. Get that merch. It's the best way that you can support Sludge Underground. And uh, Namakal, what song should we play out with today? Um, your song, obviously. One that best represents you. I would say play 2088 <laughs> and go on a trip. Sweet. So guys, we're going to be playing out with 2088 by Namakal Star from Megan and I. Just before you even close out, Megan, I'd like to thank you because this episode wouldn't have been a thing without you, dude. Uh, obviously, Megan always no, brings the you, best bro. artists. No, thank you, bro. <laughs> get, get out of here. Get out of here. Um, uh, yeah, so guys, we're going to be playing out with some Namakal Star. Until next time, it is bye for now. <laughs> The basics, we're leaving the matrix Never underestimate